afternoon and welcome uh, again to our uh, series of Hispanglia, the traces of the Hispanic uh, world in the United Kingdom. Uh, welcome to the Instituto Cervantes Manchester and Lead Channel. And uh, today, uh, as I mentioned, we start a new edition of our program, Hispanglia, the traces of the Hispanic world in the United Kingdom in which we aim to uh, get to know the political, economic and culture and social relations between the Hispanic world and the United Kingdom throughout history. On this occasion in which we also celebrate International Women's Day, we will be talking uh, with Elizabeth Gao about Manchester and one of its most important cultural symbols Enriqueta Rylands, who founded the John Rylands Library. First of all, thank you very much, Elizabeth Gao, for being there with us. Enriqueta Rylands was born in Cuba into a British French family with business interests and in the island and elsewhere in South America. A family that represents the relationships that British trading companies had on the island du during the 19th century. It was in this context that Enriqueta was born and although she left Cuba in her childhood, she kept part of her family there. Known in Manchester for being the founder of one of the cultural symbols of the city, the John Rylands Library, a life that began in Cuba and led her to become a Mancunian. To tell about uh, us, uh, to tell us about, sorry, to tell us about her life and work, we have uh, the research Elizabeth Gao, who is manuscript curator and professional archivist at the Royal, at the John Rylands Library and is carrying out an important work of analysis of the library's collection between 1889 and 908, the year in which Enriqueta Rylands uh, died. Her work aims to analyze what Enriqueta acquired, how she acquired it, and for what purposes. Central to her project is an investigation of the relationships between the tastiest interests and practical resources of the individual collector and the ambition to find a major, a major educational and cultural institution. Also to mention that uh, she curated the exhibition celebrated the cent uh, century of Ryland's death in 2008. It is a great pleasure to have you here this afternoon, and especially in a very special date like uh, the International Women's Day. Uh, so thank you again, and without further ado, I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you very much. But thank you very much for welcoming me to your series. It's really nice to talk because I've been researching Rylands, Enriqueta Rylands, and her collecting at the end of her life, I don't often get much of a chance to speak about her early life. So this is a really nice thing to be able to do. Yes, so that is great news, but because for us, as I mentioned, it's not only the date, but what is the, the meaning of libraries uh, mm -hmm. throughout history, from the very beginning of human history, since we started uh, humankind to write and to read, the libraries, I mean, uh, it would be like uh, years working about great libraries and how they have marked our uh, history, how changed our society also. So in this sense, it's a, a great honor uh, that uh, when I come, uh, what's uh, so important uh, cultural institution like the uh, uh, Ryland uh, Library uh, to, to, to share this knowledge uh, that you have uh, with the with the people in Britain and other countries also, and the connection with the Spanish world 
really is a, for us is a great honor. Thank you very much. So today we take a closer look at the key figure in Manchester's philanthropic culture, Enriqueta Rylands, whose birth and childhood was in Cuba in the 19th century. What were Enriqueta's Cuban origins? Yes. So she was born in Matanzas, which was a sort of sugar producing district in Cuba. And her mother, Juana Camilla Delcour, had inherited a share in a sugar mill called La Re Reunion Desiada, which I think roughly translates to the desired reunion, which is a nice name for a uh, nice name for a sugar plantation, if we can ignore what was going on underneath, like on the ground. So her father, Stephen Joseph Tennant, was a British merchant and his family who came from Leeds and Liverpool in Britain had set up a branch of their business in Havana in the 1830s. And so it was probably in Havana where Stephen Tennant, he was quite a cultured person and he was involved with the Philharmonic Orchestra and the sort of liberal mag magazine, um, I can't now remember its its name, um, but it was probably there that he met Juana Camilla Delcour, who was similarly from a sort of fairly sort of cultured high status background. We don't know much about Enriqueta's childhood in Cuba. There aren't any diaries or letters surviving from that period. However, we do know that in the year that she was born, 1843, there were widespread uprisings of enslaved people. And these were centered on those sugar producing districts like Matanza. She had an older sister and she had a twin brother who actually came to Manchester as well and two younger sisters. Because of, probably because of these uprisings, the family moved to Havana, which was this sort of cultured and cosmopolitan city. However, when she was only five, her father had gone to London on business, died in a horrible railway accident. Um, and so her mother was left with five children in Cuba. However, the story takes an interesting turn because two years later, when she was only seven, her mother took the daughters to New York where they ended up, well, her mother ended up remarrying a Polish emigre called Jules Fontana, who was a pianist and a protege of Chopin. So the story sort of then takes you across to New York and to France. Um, and it seems like Cuba's out of the picture, but actually because of the way families work, Cuba's never really out of the picture. Yes. I can imagine that uh, Cuba with the, this, the, the so strong uh, personality and the, the mixture of culture that they are very lively at that moment and nowadays also with the African, uh, the European and the, also the, the indigenous traditions. Mm. I can imagine for a, for a European of those, those, those times that also nowadays to, to come across and how that influence will last for forever. So Enriqueta's family is interesting in order to see the presence in British in Cuba in the 19th century and their relations they had with the Spanish. How did Enriqueta's family arrive in Cuba? Um, did they have uh, any relations with the Spanish colonial authorities? So Stephen Tennant arrived from Britain in the 1820s to do business in Cuba. Her mother, was Cuban, a, a white Creole Cuban, but her family had only actually arrived in Cuba shortly before she was born. So actually not long before Stephen Tennant did. So she wasn't Spanish Cuban, but had French and Scottish origins. Her father, Francois Lalande Delcour, was from New Orleans, from a French family. Her mother, Sophia Forbes, was the daughter of a Scottish trader, John Forbes, and a French-American woman, Marie Isabel Narbonne. Francois Delcour served in the Spanish army against the British um, and the United States and changed his name to Francisco. 
His father-in-law, John Forbes, also aligned himself with Spain against the United States and was known as Guam. As the United States gained more control, particularly in Florida, both men left for Spanish Cuba in about 1817. Yes, there, there is uh, this uh, family member, John Forbes, that, uh, as you mentioned, became uh, Juan Bor Forbes. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about him? Because uh, he even changed the name, and as you mentioned, also the how uh, he participated in the war. Uh, yes, can maybe you can tell some, something more about uh, this figure. Yes, I mean, it's interesting because we think of Enriqueta Rylands as being an adopted Mancunian, whereas I think John Forbes was an ad adopted Spanish citizen. He was born in Scotland. Um, I don't have the exact date, but I think it's sort of about the 1790s. And he was part of a company of Scottish traders. And they acquired about 8 million lakhs acres of land in Georgia, Alabama, and Florida. I mean, they acquired this land through dealing with indigenous Americans in probably quite unfair ways. So effectively, they had to trade with them and force them into debt, and then they'd repay the debt by giving up their lands. Um, and this was from the Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw and Cherokee tribes, just a huge amount of land, which became known as the Forbes Purchase. Now, although Forbes actually sold his share quite early on and made a large amount of money out of it, there were claims about this land which were going to court even in the 1890s. So, and I think the... Florida in particular is still shaped by this Forbes purchase. However, Forbes and his business partners were Scottish Tories. They were loyal to the British monarchy and they preferred to trade under the Spanish flag than under that of the United States. And so this is why he sort of became Spanish. And under the name of Juan Forbes, he wrote a report for the Spanish government describing his territories in the Spanish Floridas. So uh, actually, he 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 took the Spanish uh, uh, nationality. I at think the moment. so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's 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 difficult to know quite for sure, but he was definitely sort of working with the sort of Spanish colonial authorities in Florida. Very interesting. Enriqueta's family can serve as an example of the presence of the different trading companies with interest in Cuba. Can you tell us a bit more about this trade relations uh, relationship and the British presence in the island? Yes, and it's, it's an interesting relationship. It's quite complicated because it's to do with the Spanish colonial authorities, Britain and America, as well as France. So her father's company transported goods produced by enslaved laborers, not only sugar, but also timber, cotton and tobacco, sort of extracting the natural resources from Cuba. And those were transported between Havana, New Orleans, Charleston, which was the capital of the American slave trade, New York and Liverpool. Now, the British have often seen themselves as sort of leading the suppression of the slave trade. But it was arguably their occupation of Havana in 1762 that precipitated the growth of slavery in Cuba. So I understand, although I'm not an expert in this, that Spanish histories approach slavery in Cuba in quite different terms to British histories do. Um, so by 1817, so before Tennant moved out to Cuba, trade in slaves, if not slavery itself, was illegal across most of the Caribbean. But in Cuba, it was like a, almost like a loophole. So the sugar plantation system and the system of slavery and what in which it depended were expanding rapidly, partly to make money out of the gap left by the sort of changing leg legislation in the British Empire. And quite a lot of British merchants took advantage of this and moved to Cuba to sort of escape the legal so, so we could say maybe uh, it was 
there was like a, a British community of uh, of uh, landlords who, mm. who traded after with the, the the cacao, the coffee, or any the the agricultural products with the with the metropole going to Liverpool and other places. Yeah, but I mean, it it was sort of complicated. By it. so Stephen was part of his network of British subjects, but also his wife was connected to a network of French Americans. And so these communities were part of the white Creole elite, but they were also, there were tensions with the Spanish colonial authorities and the French and the British were sometimes accused of conspiring in rebellions, both rebellions of enslaved people and also nationalist rebellions, which tended to align themselves with the interests of the United States of America. Yes, an influence, also an influence from yeah. the independence uh, uh, war, I, I can imagine, yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, Enriqueta's Cuban heritage has not been very obvious in the library that she founded, the John Rylands Library. Why are there so few references to Enriqueta Rylands' Cuban origins in the John Rylands Library? What is your opinion? Yeah, I mean, th this is an opinion. There's nowhere that she says, she nowhere that she explains why this is the case. I think she was trying to make sure that everybody recognized the Englishness of the library and its sort of importance to a sort of English Protestant heritage. But I think there's also a sense that, the, that her early life, she wanted to sort of mark herself as having changed and almost that she was no longer that person. So in Cuba, her family had been part of an elite, but by the time she came to Britain as an orphan teenager, her cosmopolitan upbringing might have been regarded as in some circles. If you think about the sort of mad woman in the attic in Jane Eyre being a Caribbean heiress, you know, it's not an entirely secure position to be in, especially if you don't really have any independent wealth. She didn't really talk about her private life, but there was a family friend who implied that her childhood was difficult. Um, and I'm not sure she obviously gave this impression that she'd had a difficult childhood. She did, however, keep her Spanish forenames, Enriqueta Augustina, um, unlike her twin brother, who shifted from Jose Esteban to Stephen Joseph, which maybe was to sort of smooth his path in business. So to be a man with a Spanish name might be different to being a woman with a Spanish name. But because in a way she was conventionally known as Mrs. John Rylands. So her, this marriage to John Rylands also gives us a clue. He was a staunch nonconformist, a Protestant who rejected not only the Roman Catholic Church, but also the established Anglican Church. Enriqueta also became a nonconformist. And the library was in many ways a statement of this adopted dissenting identity. So if you, it's really sad that we can't be in the library today, because if we yes. were there, we will, we will, we will one day, I'd point you to the statues and the stained glass windows, which are a celebration of libraries and writing and literature, but also quite a sort of Protestant English focus to that. Um, yeah, it's very amazing because in that sense, he's an icon of the independence, mm -hmm. how he, he had this will to move from one religion, Catholic, Roman Catholic, to another religion, Protestant, mm -hmm. and at the same time, a very independent, a very, in present day terms, we would say very liberal, uh, it may be, I mean, within the context, a uh, very independent woman uh, mm -hmm. for the time. Yes, she, she, she certainly was. Although I think that a lot of that independence was enabled by the huge wealth that she came into when she married John Rylands. I mean, he was just 
of phenomenally course, rich. But uh, she, she took this uh, uh, huge uh, task that you will explain after was of mm. creating what model of one, uh, which is Warford's class library nowadays even, yes. uh, compared to Oxford, Cambridge, or uh, mm. any international libraries of first degree. And uh, at that time, Anna Guman, with a lot of wealth with uh, Abba, but I can imagine that maybe it was not uh, so easy at the time, but we will uh, speak about it uh, afterwards. So if it is also interesting, uh, uh, you, you mentioned Cuba and Riqueta, but the perception of this connection of uh, Enriqueta with Cuba, can you uh, maybe give some reference or are there any a reference of this, this connection? Yeah, well, it's interesting because she's she wasn't really known as being Cuban, but the year after she died, there was an obituary published in Cuba by Domingo Figueroa Caneda, who was the first director of the National Library of Cuba. And he realized that she was Cuban and he called her una habanera altruista. Uh, philanthropic. Altruista, yeah. Yep. Um, and he sort of claimed her for Cuba. But what's quite interesting is that his obituary, well, it's written in Spanish and it, but it gives quite a different angle to her Cuban background to the British obituaries. So in the sort of British ones, there's more likely to be this sort of vague reference to a cosmopolitan background and a difficult childhood. But he talks about Havana and its sort of cultural legacy and about her education and puts that sort of idea that her sort of literary cultured identity came from this sort of Cuban upbringing. So it's nice to get that different yeah. angle. And as a result of that, there was a relationship between the John Rylands Library and the National Library of Cuba, and they exchanged their sort of, their journals with each other for free. So we've got a sort of full run of those. But um, nowadays, it's still these relations between the National Library in Cuba and, uh, and the John Rylands Library, or I, I'm not sure if there there is at the moment, but it might be worth sort of investigating and going back to that. Yeah, that could be interesting to yeah. to know. But um, so, although in her childhood she traveled the world, Enriqueta arrived in Manchester and after the death of her husband, founded the John Rylands Library in his honor. What was that process like? Well, it was a long process. So John Rylands died in 1888. He left her two and a half million pounds to do whatever she wanted with. And then over the next 12 years, she set about managing this huge project to build a library, which is an amazing building, everyone should go and see it, to establish the collections of that library, which after 10 years were world-class collections, and also to establish the ways that that library would be sort of managed and that it would be sort of sustainable into the future. So that took at least 10 years. Sadly, she only lived for another eight years after the library opened, but even during that period, she was still collecting. She'd caught the bug for book collecting and developed a private library in her home at Longford Hall in Stratford, just outside Manchester. And she also kept giving books to the John Rylands Library. Now, one of the really big purchases that she made was in 1892, and that was of the Althorpe Library, which was at the time the finest private library in existence. It's where a lot of the early printed books in the collection came from, but it wasn't the only she, she was already collecting important books for at least a year before she bought the Althorpe Library. In 1899, just before the library opened, she was awarded the Freedom of the City of Manchester. Now, this was a huge honour. 
she was the first woman to be awarded this, which normally went to sort of very senior men in public life who had made major achievements. And it's really testament to how important the library was, particularly its collections, that they couldn't just ignore it. They had to give her this honour, even though they had to sort of check the rule books whether it was okay to give it to a woman. And there wasn't anything to stop them, so that's what they did. Um, and I think it really recognised the amount of, sort of work and effort she put into it, that it wasn't just money, although she did spend about a million pounds on it, which is an incredible amount, but it was also her sort of time and her ideas about what would make an important library. So in that sense, uh, we could make like a parallelism between uh, at that time, uh, Enriqueta Rylands made uh, Manchester uh, as a culture city through literature, books, and this great library, one of the best of the world at that moment, and nowadays also. And nowadays we have uh, Manchester, which is reinvented itself through culture and media. We have the media city, the, the uh, new tech uh, uh, revolution, because there are so many high tech uh, companies and especially through literature. It is uh, good to, to, to inform the people who will uh, uh, hear to us, uh, to listen to us, sorry, that uh, Manchester was declared uh, city of literature from the UNESCO mm -hmm. and had uh, uh, festivals of literature, music also, but especially books and, uh, and uh, the uh, parallelism, I think is very clear. At that time, Manchester was associated, that was very important, the trade, the business, but mm -hmm. with the Rylands, uh, Young Rylands Library, it changed the whole thing. And in the last, let's say, 20 years, again, Manchester, through culture and literature, is taking a, a very has taken and is taking a very important role in the in the world uh, culture scene. Uh, you mentioned that she was uh, the first woman uh, to 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 get this uh, alum, public acknowledgement, this honor from the authorities. And in my next question is re re related to that also, because how do you think uh, Enriqueta's, uh, Enriqueta Ryland's legacy contributed uh, to the role played by women in the society of her time and also the legacy to the women nowadays? Yeah, and I think it's interesting because we don't really think of Enriqueta Ryland as being a feminist although she did support a lot of the women's movement, particularly sort of women working. And I think she wanted women to be able to contribute to society and be sort of recognized when they did so. Now, her, the freedom of the city was, you know, it, it was announced in the sort of national press, it was a big thing, but also it, received particular sort of coverage in the sort of women's magazines and women's write, writing sort of aimed at women, where she was a sort of exemplar of what women could do. And it was quite an unusual sort of form of philanthropy for women who tended to be more associated with sort of caring occupations and sort of small scale philanthropy. So for a woman to, institute a grand national library was really quite a remarkable thing and I think that she is an inspiring figure even now um, not that we've got the sort of money to do what she did but I think to remember that women have done things and not been recognized for them now she was recognized in her time, but then over the next hundred years, she was forgotten about quite a lot. And a lot of the histories of the library effectively ignore her or think that she was just the money. But I the, think- in sense of, uh, We are very happy that you are here today, uh, remembering the, this uh, uh, astonishing, this superb uh, woman who contributed so much for the, not only for Manchester, but for Britain, for the world, uh, through this 
the creation of this library, her legacy, the visibility of women, and uh, also the uh, not so fair, uh, the, the fact that uh, she has been uh, maybe not imagined, but is not well known and sometimes forgotten. So in that sense, the, this uh, dialogue, uh, we want to contribute also for the visibility of the work and the and Enriqueta Rylands as uh, a figure. In that sense, I would like to also to, to, to remember something that uh, is also not very well known, but uh, we are speaking about the relations and the Hispanic world and uh, Britain history and facts. And uh, I want to, to remember today, very special day, International Women's Day, that the first specialized library for women in Spain and Europe uh, was the Francesca Bonemaison Library created in 909 in Barcelona. It was the first library for women topics in, in Europe. Then uh, we had in London 1926, Paris 1933, Amsterdam in 1935 and so on. But uh, uh, we are very happy to, 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 to inform also of this fact in this special day. Uh, the Young Rylands uh, Library is one of the most important libraries of the world. We have uh, mentioned that several times. <laughs> Where does the importance of its collection lie? And it's their content related to the Hispanic culture and later in America among the, 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 its holdings? Well, the John Rylands Library has grown a lot since Rylands founded it. But even then, the collections were world class especially in early printed books, Bibles, literature, especially English literature, history and fine modern printing. So she wasn't only interested in old books, but she wanted the collections to be useful, but also show the sort of best of modern printing. Since 1901, when Rylands bought the collection of manuscripts from the Earl of Crawford, Earls of Crawford, the library has also been a centre for manuscript research. It's also include, always included sort of ancient and modern, but this now goes from cuneiform tablets and papyri, including the famous Gospel of John fragment, up to contemporary printing and archives. And now we even preserve digital emails from the Carcanet Press publisher. I mean, what was most important to Rylands in her founding of the Rylands Library was actually religion. And really the collecting of English Bibles sparked the collecting of rare books more broadly. But the collections were always broader, covering most of the humanities. And this breadth in collecting continues. This means that there are certainly important collections relating to Spain and Latin America including Spanish literature in Spanish and in translation, books about the histories and geographies of Spain and Latin America, and books printed in Spain. But considering Rowan's Cuban origins, there's not really much in the founding collections to represent this. Indeed, for, for you today, I looked up Don Quixote to see what editions we held. Um, and the earliest editions that we have in Spanish and in English were both from both from the Althorpe Library. It, it's a curious fact that her stepfather, Jules Fontana, actually translated Don Quixote from Spanish into Polish. Oh. But, but I don't know whether this was just in manuscript. I've, I've not been able to find any trace of this other than that someone says that this is so. Um, Enriqueta herself seems to be more interested in illustrated copies and in her private library at Longford Hall she had quite a few copies from the 1890s with illustrations by sort of contemporary artists. Um, one was a book which covered the history of illustrations of Don Quixote for 380 years. But then in the year before she died in 1907, when she was really buying books, she'd been ill for a few years and she was buying books to sort of comfort herself. 
um, and she bought a newly printed illustrated English translation, which she paid £30 for, which is equivalent to about £3,000 today. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah, a Don Quixote, uh, it was a Don Quixote with illustrations. Yes, in English. And then she had also bought a Spanish translation, which was printed in Edinburgh, and it was one of 30 copies on special paper. So these were sort of, they were new books, but they weren't just little paperback novels. But those books nowadays, one, uh, you can uh, have a look. I mean, the public, or you, you, you have to have a special permission to, to have access to those books. Are they in the private library? No, from, no, no. Uh, so, so, Rylands, no. Or in the John Rylands library? So they're all in the John Rylands Library on Deansgate, which is where we hold the special collections. You don't need special permission, although at the moment the library is closed. So it's Normal a bit times. Awkward. But anybody, anybody can come and access those books. It helps if you send us an email to let us know that you're coming. Um, but especially for the more modern books, it's quite straightforward to come and see them. So if you're interested in Spanish history or literature, no, but have a look on the website. To get to know it. and to, to have a contact with those old uh, uh, printed, illustrated Don Quixote mm. exemplars, it's something that uh, I, I will try to do for, for sure, because also we are neighbors, we are in this gate, and also, uh, we are very proud that uh, Cervantes Institute is in the one of the first public libraries in Britain. The, mm -hmm. Our building is great uh, building, and originally it was a public library. So mm -hmm. we are very, very, very honored for, to have the to be in this building so important also in the city, and to have the John Rylands Library as neighbors. So we are really happy. So uh, thank you very much. It was. Great, uh, very, very informative, very, very interesting. Uh, I only have to say thank you, thank you, because uh, I hope we have we have contributed to the visibility of uh, Enriqueta Rylands. The role of women in the history is so important and sometimes not so visible. And uh, we uh, continue with our series of dialogues about the relations between the Spanish. Hispanic world and Britain. And uh, I hope in a very near future to be, pay a visit to your library. And also you are invited to, to visit our uh, Instituto Cervantes in this gate. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you who are uh, listening to, to us today. Thank you. Thank you, it's been a real pleasure.